me, I can take blood. I can set line. Nothing. There's nothing I cannot do. Uh -huh. So because you're not a life scientist, you believe it should end at you knowing how to take blood or how to set cannabis. My dear, as a nurse, there are some basic lab values that you should know. So when they bring that test results back, you can look through it, know what is wrong with your patient, and know what to suggest and how to advocate. Don't just be the nurse that can take blood. In today's video, I'm going to be talking about some basic lab values that as a nurse, you should know them, what they mean when they are high, what it means when they are low, and things or interventions you should be expecting to implement for your patient. <laughs> Hi, my name is Imola Yabusari. I am a Nigerian registered nurse, a midwife. I'm also a United Kingdom registered nurse. And on this channel, I film content related to nursing and healthcare. If you're interested in any content like that, do click on the subscribe button to join the YouTube family and also on the bell icon so you don't miss out when I drop another amazing video. With that being said, let's get into it. The first test I'll be talking about is the full blood count or the complete blood count. I'm very sure we hear this test a lot in the hospital. And a full blood count is a common blood test that is used to measure the number and status of different blood cells, like the red blood cells, the white blood cells, and the platelets. In the full blood count test, one um, blood value that is going to be looked out for is the hemoglobin levels. The sample is obviously the blood, and it is tested because you want to measure the oxygen cap carrying capacity of the blood. Normally, it should be between um, 12 to 18 gram per day or based on gender. Now, when the hemoglobin levels are high, it means that person is probably dehydrated and there's probably a chance of polycythemia. So in that situation, you'll be expecting that they will rehydrate the patient either by um, more fluid intake orally or they will give them IV fluids just to rehydrate the patient. And you also have to start assessing the patients for hypoxia. You check the um, oxygen saturation levels using your pulse oximeter if the hemoglobin levels are low that means there is possibility of uh, that means there's anemia actually and it could be that the person is bleeding now probably internal external there's there's so many things ways the patient can bleed so in that situation you would be thinking of blood transfusion or if there would be iron or vitamin supplements prescribed to that patient so as a nurse you're supposed to um, let the physician or whoever is in charge know immediately okay i um, think we need to prescribe uh, a blood transfusion order or write a transition order for this patient if the hemoglobin levels are very low so as a nurse you should always look out for this next is the hematocrit level which is tested to know the percentage of red blood cells in the blood ideally there should it should be between 37 to 52 percent now when the hematocrit level is high that points towards dehydration uh polycythemia and the next thing you'll be thinking of is rehydrating the patients either by oral fluids or iv fluids then giving oxygen therapy as well if it is low that is anemia and it could also be because of fluid overload so the expectation is to start treating the underlying anemia whatever is causing that anemia try to treat it and also ensure that you take input and output know how much fluid you are taking in how much they are excreting just to make sure there is fluid balance still on that flu blood count the next is the white blood cell count white blood cells levels can easily tell us if the patient has an infection or an inflammation ideally it should be about 4000 to 11000 and if the white blood cell level is high that means the patient possibly has an infection or an inflammation either of the two because obviously the white blood cells are usually called the soldiers of the body so if there's an infection they would be so much in the body because they are trying to combat the infection so in this type of situation you'd be expecting that you want to control the source of infection or you want to treat the infection with antibiotics or antiviral or antifungal depending on what is causing the infection if the white blood cell count is low, then there is probably a bone marrow suppression or the person is on chemotherapy. Now, in that situation, you want to make sure that the patient does not become infected. So there would be a reverse isolation. So instead of isolating the patient, uh, instead of trying to isolate the patient so that they cannot infect other people, you are isolating the patient away from other people so that other people do not infect the patient 
the nurse has to go into the patient's room with full PPE, then there should also be neutropenic precautions put in place for that particular patient so that infection does not set in. Still on the full blood count, the platelet levels can also be checked. And this is because it gives a pointer to the clotting ability of that patient. Normally, it should be between 150,000 to 450,000. When the, the, the levels are high, that um, is pointing tr towards thrombocytosis, which means there is high risk for the patient to have blood clots. And once there is blood clots in the body, a lot of things could happen because blood clots could get into the lungs, it could get into the blood vessels anywhere, like it could, it could like block anywhere and that would cause an issue. So definitely you will be expecting patients to go on anticoagulants. I'll leave the link to my video on anticoagulants in the description box below. Aside that, if the platelet levels are low, that means the patient can also bleed. There's a bleeding risk and that is thrombocytopenia. In that situation, you need to make sure that you put in place bleeding precautions, ensure that the patient does not get injured. Nothing is cutting the patient, sharp objects are taken away from the patient and in some situations, you may have to transfuse platelets. Another common sample that is taken in the hospital are urine samples. And the urine test can be used for different reasons. You can use it to detect a wide range of disorders and even manage them, like know if a person is responding well to treatment. Even the urine can be used to detect pregnancies. So urine tests are things you would commonly see in the hospital. So for a basic urinalysis, there are so many things that could be checked for or their presence could be checked for in your urine sample. And this urinalysis is done to just get like a general health check to be able to detect infections as well as kidney issues. If leukocytes or nitrites are found in the urine, that indicates an infection. So definitely you would be expecting to treat an infection, either antibiotics for UTI or whatever that infection could be. If protein is found in the urine, that indicates a kidney damage. So you need to start monitoring the renal function and manage any underlying cause of the kidney damage. It could be because of um, the amount of fluids the person is taking in. It could be because of medications. It could be because of another disease or infection or condition that the patient is suffering from. If blood is found in the urine, that also indicates an infection. It could be because there are stones in the kidney and it could be because of a trauma in the um, urinary system. So you would need to further evaluate what exactly is happening, why there's blood, if it's because of medication, whatever is causing it and treat that. Sometimes a urine sample can also be cultured. It's called a urine culture. And it is done to identify bacterial infection in the urinary tract to know what type of bacteria is causing the infection and the type of antibiotic that they are sensitive to. So it could be like a culture and sensitivity test. If it is positive, that means there is a UTI and you go for whatever antibiotic that particular bacteria is sensitive to. And if it is negative, that means there's no infection. In some situations, you could also have a 24-hour urine collection, which means that they will start collecting all the urine produced by a person for a total of 24 hours like they can start at 12 a.m and end it at 11 59 p.m the reason this is done is because they want to evaluate the kidney functions the protein levels or hormone excretion by the kidneys and if there is high protein that means there is a kidney damage and you want to treat the kidney disease and adjust any medication that the patient is on and if there is no issue if it is normal then that means there is no or there are no abnormalities and the patient is fine so as a nurse you should always look out for the results of this test so that when the patient or the patient relative comes to ask you you're not just there looking and saying um, um let's let's wait for somebody to come and looks like you don't even know what you're doing there as a nurse just before i move on if you're enjoying this video first give it a thumbs up so that youtube knows that this video is valuable and push it out to all our nursing students that might need the video secondly if you're a nursing student and you're looking for a free place a very free place to listen to audio tutorials get quizzes as well as you know get study plans that would help you to plan towards your council exams like your final nursing exams you can check out my website i'll leave all the links to that in the description box below there are so many things resourceful materials that you will find on there that would be very very useful to you so let's go on
The next test I'll be talking about are the basic metabolic panel, which is actually a blood test that helps to check the body's fluid balance, the level of electrolytes, and see how well the kidneys are working. These are tests that you'd have come across their results multiple times, but you just may not know that that is what they are. So let's talk about each of the electrolytes or the values that will be looked out for in this BMP test. First, we'll talk about the sodium level, which is tested because of fluid and electrolyte balance. Normally, it should be between 135 to 145. If it's as high, that means the patient is dehydrated and has hypernatremia. In that situation, you will be expecting to get some hypotonic IV fluids. If you want to see my videos on IV fluids, I'll leave it down in the description box below. If it is low, the patient is suffering from hyponatremia and it would be because of fluid overload. So in that situation, you may want to give some hypertonic saline or put the patient on fluid restriction, which means they would probably be taking like maybe one liter throughout the day or 1.5 liters of water throughout the day. You measure, you give them like a measuring jog to know the amount of water they are taking in daily. Next, we talk about potassium which would help to look at the heart and muscle function. Normally, it should be between 3.5 to 5. If it is high, that is hyperkalemia, and that could mean the patient is already having arrhythmias. In that situation, you may want to give insulin with glucose or make the patient go for dialysis. I know this is a very expensive procedure, but <laughs> that's where we are. If it is low, that patient is suffering from hypokalemia, the patient will also have arrhythmias. In that situation, you may be thinking of replacing the potassium that the patient does not have or has lost, either by giving oral potassium supplements or intravenous potassium supplements. Next, let's talk about the calcium levels, which would point to bone health and muscle function. Normally, it should be between 8.5 to 10.5 mg per deal. When it is high, that patient is suffering from hypercalcemia. The patient could be experiencing lethargy and arrhythmias. That situation you may want to give IV fluids as well as biphosphonates. If the um, patient's calcium levels is low or are low, that patient is suffering from hypocalcemia. That patient could be having tetany. That patient could also come down with seizures if care is not taken. In that situation, you may want to give calcium gluconate IV. Remember, as a nurse, you still have to wait for somebody to prescribe. In this situation, if what should be prescribed has not been done, you can advocate for whoever is meant to prescribe it to do it on time. Once you have a look at this test results and you see that this patient needs some attention. Moving on to glucose. This one is very straightforward. You'd have done it a lot of times. And it is tested to know the blood sugar levels of the patient and control the levels. Fasting blood sugar should be between 70 to 100 mg per year, which would be like 3.9 to 5.5 mmol per liter. And random blood glucose would be around 110 to 140 mg per year, which would be 6.1 to 7.8 mmol per liter. If it is high, that patient has hyperglycemia. That could be pointing towards diabetes if the patient is already a known diabetic patient and in that situation you give your oral hypoglycemic agents your metformin your glycoside and it could be insulin depending on whatever that patient has been placed on if the glucose level are low that is hypoglycemia you want to get the glucose level back up so you either give glucose orally or you give iv dextrose finally let's talk about the creatinine levels which would be tested to evaluate the kidney functions Normally, it should be between 0.6 to 1.2 mg per deal. And if the range is higher than normal, that means there is a kidney dysfunction and you may need to un manage the underlying kidney issue that that patient is suffering from or consider uh, starting the patient on dialysis. Another test that you commonly hear in the hospital are liver function tests, popularly called LFTs. And they are blood tests that are used to um, find out either causes of the symptoms or monitored liver disease or damage. We're talking about two major things or two common things under these tests. First, we'll talk about the ALT and ASTs, which are tested to know the liver health. The ALT should be about 7 to 56, while the AST should be about 10 to 40. Once these levels are higher than normal, that indicates a liver damage. It could be because of excessive intake of alcohol, could be that the liver is inflamed you know anything can happen 
to cause anything that affects the liver will cause the levels of the ALT and ASC, ASDs to rise. And that means you have to treat the underlying causes. Whatever is causing that damage is what you need to treat. Next are the biliary bean levels. The biliary bean levels are checked to know the liver and bowel duct function. When you hear biliary bean, the next thing that could come to your head is jaundice. Yes, once the levels of the biliary beans are high, then that means the patient is um already undergoing jaundice. Normally, it should be between 0.1 to 1.2 milligrams per year. So if the patient is undergoing jaundice, you need to treat the underlying cause. Whatever is impeding the liver and bowel duct function, either it's an obstruction, whatever it is, you need to treat it and take it out. Now, because I'm a nurse that works on a cardiology ward, I'm going to chip this in, which are cardiology-related laboratory values. A very common one that I come across almost every day of my life on the ward are the troponin I's and T's. These two values are used to detect damages to the heart muscles and they are also very important when you're trying to diagnose um, a myocardial infarction or if a patient is already like if a patient is undergoing a heart attack it should be less than 0.4 but whatever value is used by the lab they would always give you like a value to compare it with it is always on the result slip the result paper it will always be translated if it is high that means the patient is already having a myocardial infarction or there's something wrong with the heart in that situation, you may have to start giving GTN sprays, either IVs or sprays, give morphine. The patient may have to go in for surgery to get a stent put in, whatever can be done depending on the severity. These are some of the laboratory values you should know or have at the back of your hand as a nurse so that nobody starts saying things or asking you questions and you're just there looking.